For the Climate Discussion Nexus, I'm John Robson. And this week, we want to wave to all our viewers in Japan, and then particularly thank Baz W. for making a monthly pledge and encouraging others to do the same. On the subject of pledges, I also want to mention that while we try to thank all donors personally, if you contribute via Interact, we actually don't get contact information, which doesn't make us any less grateful, but it does make us less communicative. Okay, and now I want to try and shoo away some vultures. Specifically, the ones that swooped in in the wake of Hurricane Ida to blame it on climate change before we were even done counting the dead. You know, we got headlines like how climate change is fueling hurricanes like Ida, and climate scientist Bernie Sanders, with a BA in political science, tweeted, quote, The destruction from Hurricane Ida is devastating. Our thoughts are with those in danger and with first responders saving lives. But let's be clear. If we do not act boldly to combat climate change, what we see today will become the norm as the planet becomes more uninhabitable." Unquote. To which Michael Schellenberger fired back, first noting the tumbling death toll from disasters, and then reminding the senator that, quote, according to NOAA, climate change will make hurricanes 25% less frequent and just 5% more intense, not enough to increase harm. The New York Times, however, disagreed with the science, saying, quote, The storm was propelled in speed and strength by the Gulf's very warm waters. For many, the storm stirred painful reminders of the death and devastation that Katrina wrought in 2005, end quote. Which surely raises the question why the storms haven't been getting steadily worse since 2005. Perhaps because the waters haven't warmed despite all the warming? In a post objecting to the vultures, atmospheric scientist Cliff Mass reprinted Roger Pilkey Jr.'s famous slide showing continental United States landfalling hurricanes declining from 1900 through 2020, and then produced a table of water temperature in the Gulf of Mexico in August, showing less than one degree Celsius of warming in 40 years, and one of July temperatures since 1948, showing virtually no trend, with July of this year being relatively cool. And now, a word from our sponsor. And that's you because at the Climate Discussion Nexus, we're dependent upon support from our viewers and our readers. Please go to our donate page, make a one-time pledge, or if you can, a monthly one. I'm not talking a lot of money, though. If you've got it, we'll take it. $2 a month, $3, $5. That's the sustaining funding that we need to produce these videos on our newsletter. And now, back to me. As Ida moved north and east, the New York Times went, quote, The deadly flooding in the northeast, on the heels of destruction from Louisiana to California, shows the limits of adapting to climate change. Experts say it will only get worse, end quote, and so on. In the newsletter, we also note a significant problem with climate alarmism, which is its focus on the few places having bad weather and never on the far more numerous ones that aren't on the apparent theory that climate change only makes weather worse, so nowhere that it's currently nice might have had a storm if climate hadn't changed. Seriously, did anyone say, oh, India had a good harvest this year because of climate change, or Toronto had a temperate summer? No. Instead, according to Catherine Hayhoe and Friedrich Otto in the New York Times, the lovely computer models let smart, caring people like them know exactly what the world would have been like without climate change and who should get all the blame. And apparently this cutting-edge science of attribution doesn't describe any improvements anywhere to climate change. Instead, they say, quote, The evidence and the data are already clear. The faster we cut our emissions, the better off we'll all be, end quote. All of us. But in fact, there's a lot of evidence to suggest something very different. And here we return to Brian Fagan's book, The Little Ice Age, How Climate Made History, 1300 to 1850, in which he produces a lot of evidence that the Little Ice Age that followed the medieval warm period didn't just bring colder temperatures, it brought far worse weather, including terrible storms, as well as having dreadful effects on agriculture. In a characteristic passage on pages 66 to 67, he writes, In the early 1400s, more damaging storm surges attacked densely populated shorelines. On August 19, 1413, a great southerly storm at extreme low tide buried the small town of Forvey near Aberdeen in northeastern Scotland under a 30-meter sand dune. More than 100,000 people are said to have died in the great storms of 1421 and 1446. Now, it's all fine and good to blame climate change for bad weather if it's nice in 90% of places now and bad in 10, but 40 years ago it was 95 and 5. But what if it's not? If it's still 90-10, or actually went from 80-20 to 19 10, where are the places where it got nicer because of climate change, and how do you know? My goodness, global warming sure benefits crickets. 
On the other hand, a news story says it's going to make volcanoes worse, which won't be easy. Oh, and here let me note, climate change skeptics sometimes say, aha, volcanoes give off more greenhouse gases than humans. Uh, but they don't. Big eruptions promote cooling due to particulates, sulfur dioxide, and so on, but mostly volcanoes just seep out GHGs in quantities that, as far as we can tell, are fairly small relative not just to the vast carbon cycle, but even to our own modest contribution. But apparently it's about to get worse, researchers say. Namely, quote, large magnitude eruptions will have greater effects as the climate continues to warm. However, the cooling effects of small and medium-sized eruptions could shrink by as much as 75%, end quote. And the cooling will remain brief. They point out that when Mount Pinatubo blew its top in 1992, it cooled the planet by about 5 degrees Celsius. But, the press release says, quote, in comparison, human activities have warmed global temperatures by over 1 degree Celsius since 1850. However, the effects of volcanic aerosols only persist for one or two years, while anthropogenic greenhouse gases will affect the climate for centuries, end quote. Now, logically, if that's the case, we should still be experiencing the impact of centuries ago emissions. But never mind, because, quote, the researchers used global climate models combined with volcanic plume models to simulate how the aerosols emitted by volcanic eruptions might be affected by climate change, end quote. Yeah, might. Unless they're not. Because the models can't really do atmospheric physics, particularly cloud formation, which means that, in fact, nobody knows. Just as nobody knows why Joe Biden's administration hates fossil fuels so much that they're opening up vast parts of the Gulf of Mexico and the continental United States to new drilling while blocking pipelines from Canada. Come on, man. Of course, one reason Biden needs domestic oil, and Canadian oil, we remind him, is the ongoing confrontation with China, which just told Biden he better shut up about human rights and its military expansion if he wants them to cooperate on climate, which they aren't doing anyway and don't plan to. But with Europe throwing in the towel on energy independence, and indeed on having enough energy, and with Vladimir Putin rubbing his hands with glee and consequence, at least one free society better have enough fuel to keep its economy and its military going. Mind you, even in the United States, the rot is pretty deep. The California Coastal Commission just said that that state must plan for 3.5 feet of sea level rise over 30 years, which will cost the state government and some of its cities billions of dollars that are desperately needed elsewhere, even though actual local tide gauge data suggest a far more reasonable as 2.4 inches, not feet. Continuing to push back against this kind of thing, we bring another installment of University of Guelph professor Ross McKittrick on Stephen Coonan's book Unsettled. This time, the disturbing fact that the stock of CO2 in the atmosphere is so vast compared to annual emissions, which in turn are tied pretty closely to prosperity, that the whole idea of going carbon neutral and of having it matter if we somehow did is inane, and so is pretty much all existing climate policy. If everyone somehow met their Paris targets, the impact by 2100 would be too small to measure. And we also bring another look at what the latest IPCC report really said, this time about hydrological streamflow deficits. Once again, it's a mixed picture with strong spatial variability. And, yes, even more proof from CO2science.org that soybeans like CO2. So, it really is true. Colder temperatures bring bad weather and kill crops. Warming does not. For the Climate Discussion Nexus, I'm John Robson.